Hello and welcome to the Majlis, a Central Asia podcast at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. I am Mohammed Tahir, Director of the Turkmen Service at Radio Free Europe. Corruption in Central Asia is not a flash news. Citizens of those countries face it daily. Visitors come across with this pandemic at some point of their short stay in those countries and major foreign investors also affected by this environment. But recent revelation in Open Society Institute report on corruption in Uzbekistan takes us entirely to a new level where it appears that the corruption not only widespread in the country but it is used as a tool by the authorities to insert their authority, control in by loyalties. The report also points out that some foreign companies too involved in this dirty deal. Therefore, there is no surprise to learn that every year Uzbekistan, together with Turkmenistan, scores lowest in annual reports released by the Transparency International's Corruption Index. Today, in the Majlis, a Central Asia podcast, we are planning to discuss corruption in Central Asia, draw a comparison between the countries and tendencies in the region, and look into How do this affect investment, climate, business, societies, and politics? To discuss the subject, I have the author of the recent uh, Open Society Institute report on Uzbekistan, Dr. David Lewis. David, welcome to the show. Hi, great to be with you. Very nice to have you. Uh, Brian Campbell, U.S. Uh, attorney with inside knowledge of an investigation run by the U.S. Department of Justice on one of the corruption cases in Uzbekistan is also joining us. Brian, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you for being part of the Majlis today. And Natalia Malarchuk, National Chair of Kazakhstan Chapter of Transparency International, is also joining us from Kazakhstan today. Natalia, welcome to the show. Hello. Nice to hear you. Thank you, Natalia. And also Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlak Oazi, a Central Asia blog at Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty, is also joining me here in the studio. Bruce, welcome to the Majlis. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Majlis today. Let's talk a little bit about the recent report, David. Uh, please take us through your major finding and surprises, perhaps less surprising findings in Uzbekistan. Well, I think, uh, as you said before, anyone who lives in Central Asia or has traveled around the region won't be surprised to find that uh, a fairly long research report concludes that corruption is endemic and widespread in the country. I think what we've tried to do is go beyond the sort of generalities and try to break it down into what corruption actually does, what impact it has, and some of the mechanisms that use to assert control both over business and over politics. And I think uh, partly because I'm a, I'm a uh, political scientist rather than uh, uh, an economist, I tend to look at the political side of it. But I think it is very important to stress that corruption now forms an important part of the political system, essentially, in Uzbekistan. And that means that it's about questions of power. It's about questions of relations between different elite groups. And potentially uh, the big question, of course, of the political succession in Uzbekistan, much of those decisions are related to the corrupt practices that go on in the political and in the business sphere. So corruption essentially becomes a means of control, a way of running patronage networks, a way for uh, different leaders to control different parts of the country and different business groups. So in that sense, it becomes part of the system that makes it very, very difficult, of course, to root it out. When we do see these anti-corruption uh, campaigns that we see from time to time, they inevitably are very selective. And what they really do is target uh, people who've fallen out of favor or particular people who have not been loyal enough, should we say, to the leadership. What they don't do is change the system. And in the report, we go through some of the systemic problems that give rise to corruption. And a lot, a lot of that comes back to the economic system. So in Uzbekistan, of course, been very little structural economic reform. That means there's lots of opportunities for corrupt practice in cross-border trade, in uh, currency conversion, uh, as very opaque and complex tax structures that make it very easy to provide the means for corrupt officials to make money from uh, business people. So in other words, it's a combination of politics and institutional and economic factors that really gives rise to, to the level of corruption we see today. And then just finally, uh, the other big point, and I'm sure Brian will talk about this as well, 
is the extent to which this is not just uh, confined to the boundaries of Uzbekistan. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. What we see now is this is, you know, this is transnational corruption, right? I'm sitting here in London, and anyone else in Europe will recognize that they, there's a, a, a very close connection between the big financial centers of the world and what goes on in Central Asia. So it's no longer enough to say it's a problem in Central Asia. It's actually a problem for all of us, and it's a problem that uh, Western countries have contributed to as well. Right. Uh, just to follow up that, uh, D- David, you have touched almost all sectors uh, in, in, in your report. Was there any sector uh, where level of corruption is higher than the other? Uh, well, inevitably, uh, essentially, you know, corruption is a, if you like, it's a sort of rational economic mechanism, right? So in a way, it follows the sectors where there is significant potential for financial gain. So obviously anywhere where there's big levels of foreign investment, that looks like a lucrative sector for people to uh, make a good deal of money. We know now quite a lot about the telecom sector. Mm. It's been one of the most the most corrupted, it appears, from the materials that's now coming out in the U.S. investigations. And that's for obvious reasons, in a way. It's a, it's a sector that's heavily controlled by the government. You need a license and lots of government support to make it happen. But it also produces this very heavy cash flow and has very potentially very high profits. So those kind of areas are the ones that are most vulnerable normally to high levels of corruption. Brian, uh, David touched at uh, the communication uh, sector in Uzbekistan in terms of the corruption. And, uh, we know that uh, Uzbek president's daughter, Gulnara Karimova, was one of the main actors in that uh, corrupt uh, business. Were you surprised by the extent of the activities of the ruling families uh, in corrupt businesses. You are involved in this investigation of one of such cases involving uh, Gulnara, right, uh, Brian? Uh, that's correct. Um, I'm uh, Just to be very clear, so I'm involved from an outside capacity as an attorney in Washington where right. I'm advising different organizations, including uh, Uzbeks in, in the diaspora, different Uzbek civil society organizations, uh, from my position as legal advisor to the Cotton Campaign, which is the campaign to end forced labor in Uzbekistan as mm. well. Um, and the answer is no. I'm not at all surprised about the level of corruption that is going on. I'm more surprised at the, and, and very pleased, at the ability of the U.S. government working in partnership with other governments, and, and in particular the, the Swedish government, the Swiss government, and others, um, to uncover just the sheer volume of money, cash money that has been moved around with regards to the Karimov corruption charges. And, um, you know, I think this would be the largest for asset forfeiture case that the U.S. has ever brought, uh, I believe. And, and just that alone, I think, is remarkable. It's also remarkable that, that it's upwards of $850 million dollars bribery money Hmm. that was passed and paid between accounts um, that began in Latvia, moved to uh, some of them. Some of them began in the Netherlands. Some began in in Russia in terms of how the payments were moved. But ultimately, they've been moved around seamlessly without any questions asked um, by banks in different jurisdictions. And right now, the money is sitting and currently frozen due to a mutual legal assistance request by the U.S. government in bank accounts in Luxembourg, Belgium, Ireland, and Switzerland. Uh There are actually two cases for a total of $850 million in corrupt money that that the U.S. government is attempting to to see. Um, The first case was filed last, and that was in June of last year, and that was for $300 million, and that was related to three companies, shell companies created by Gulnar Karimov, and those those companies were paid $300 million by two different telecommunications companies, Vimplecom and MTS. There's a second case that was just filed recently, about a month or two ago, and it is a second tranche of corrupt money that has been paid in bribery to uh, what the U.S. government refers to as, as government official A, but we all know as hmm. Lara Karima. And that, though it's a separate case, it's, it's, uh, that, that one stems out of the Talia Sonero uh, corruption settlement that was entered into between the Swedish company and the U.S. government and the Swedish government. 
And that money, um, the company has already admitted that it has committed this crime of bribery, has provided the information, has paid their fine, and has entered into their own agreement uh, with the U.S. government in terms of paying, being held accountable for it. And as a part of that, as you can see, more information keeps coming up, and they, the U.S. government is able to, I think, has done a great job tracing these assets. I think largely through the support of the Western companies in this case that were caught with their hands uh, in you know, paying money um, in bribes. Huh. So I think, um, yes, to answer your question, it's a huge amount of money, huh. um, but I am not at all surprised. Huh. Because to go back to a question that you asked, David, um, you know, as legal advisor of the Cotton uh, Campaign, where we've been trying to end forced labor, you know, one of the main concerns we have is that the entire cotton sector itself is structured as a corrupt mechanism. The way that the prices are set, the way that the money disappears into uh, this Colts fund, a, a mysterious fund that's off the budget, that's off the records. These are absolutely, uh, it takes up the entire uh, sector of cotton. The whole thing is built on this corrupt pyramid scheme. And corruption is also not just a Western company, for example, or even a, a Uzbek company who's paying money in bribes or taking uh, assets of the state and selling them for their own purposes. Corruption that we've seen in Uzbekistan through the reporting and through from the cotton campaign also happens at, at the very local level. Yeah. Um, people who have to pay money to get out of doing the cotton harvest, things like that. And so I think that Uzbekistan is, is the, the, the industry, the agriculture industry, its telecommunications industry, they are built on a concept of corruption. Uh, so that way certain people can profit off the book. Right. Let, let's, and this, yeah, let's expand this a little bit, uh, Brian, uh, by talking to uh, Natalia Malarchuk. Uh, who is in Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. how familiar these uh, cases looks like to you sitting in Kazakhstan, Natalia? Well, first of all, it's uh, the picture you described is very scary. <laughs> uh, living here, uh, you, uh, you can see many things, but when you analyze it, yes, it's familiar, and uh, unfortunately it's familiar. But uh, I'd like to argue some um, point of view of our speakers is that corruption is a rational thing for, uh, for us. Uh, maybe last five years, hmm. everybody started to understand, including government officials, that uh, corruption destroys us. And um, real steps we see uh, how they do. Uh, the second point is that um, we are, uh, I can tell you a situation from point of view Transparency International and uh, our researches we do here and how we uh, research the problem itself. We can divide it into, into three points. It's a business corruption, political corruption, and a petty corruption. Yes. Uh, from point of view of petty corruption, uh, citizens really face many cases that connect to corruption, but uh, our Observations and our analysis of practices of this petty corruption says that uh, citizens accept it and they don't want to refuse it just because it's, um, they like it. Hmm. They, it's useful, it's uh, suitable, it's, uh, they like it. Uh, and uh, it's, very, it's too hard for us, for example, as non-government organization, to explain them that uh, you destroy your life and don't participate in corruption. The second level is very important to us, especially right now in crisis period. Right. Because uh, cash uh, in the budget of the country, uh, it decreases daily. We don't have investment enough in the country, and uh, right now, uh, the real threat that uh, it is in Kazakhstan, it's a business corruption, uh, especially connected to international business companies, huh. and, uh, especially to foreign co companies, because our uh, researches and latest uh, corporate corruption report uh, says that almost 70% of companies that work and operate in Kazakhstan, they do not want to observe, uh, observe anti-corruption practices. They don't want to provide anti-corruption policies in their business here. And uh, we have real cases when foreign comp companies uh, just had a line budget connected to corruption. 
and the and the political corruption, especially. Uh, this is a huge. Like, it's, it's so-called grand corruption in Kazakhstan. It connected to political <laughs> elite elite groups uh, that exist in Kazakhstan, and uh, they actually nobody knows right now how to deal with this because it connected to budget, country budget uh, mis uh, how <laughs> misbehavior or. Uh, people simply steal, uh, stealing budget money from, uh, and um, this is what picture we have right now. Right. But no. uh, but uh, one one more point to our speakers: there are good steps, anti-corruption steps taken by governments, uh, including Uzbekistan, uh, including in Tajikistan. I don't know about Turkmenistan because it's closed, absolutely closed, and in Kazakhstan. But um, International experts, international investors uh, have a serious lack of information. We also do. Uh, we can't provide, uh, in Kazakhstan government can't provide uh, um, normal information on what changes they uh, happened here and the uh, lack of experts that can analyze this fear of uh, lifestyle with so corruption, I mean, because uh, many reports that you read about our countries are connected directly to political opponents, and it's very subjective. Hmm. I'm not for the government, I'm not for the opposition, but still very much information um, that foreign experts uh, from U.S., from U.K., from Europe, have it's still connected directly connected to political interest of some uh, some people. This is what we have here. Right, Natalia. B- before you, David, you don't mind, I'd love to respond. Uh, sure, go on, please. Yeah, I I just like to respond that that you know I we we do hear that a lot with regards to information that is produced by people I work with <coughs> and others is not credible for some reason because it's tied to political opposition. And I just want to encourage everybody that, that what's really needed is, is a move towards democracy and that just because somebody is a part of a political opposition, I'll say, and, and I'll also note that that is not the case with regards to the information that I'm discussing today, but to the extent mm-hmm. that it is, and we've heard this from the Uzbek government and others in the cotton sector, uh, you know, that's, that doesn't mean that the facts aren't true. You can have a political motivation and still have very true, very well-researched facts. And I think one of the challenges in addressing corruption is moving away from the cult of personality and the way that, that people say, well, you're shaming me and that's because you have an ulterior motive. Right, and moving more towards a respectful uh, space where different ideas can be shared um, and people aren't scared to talk. Because it's the silence that enables corruption. It's the fear of speaking out that enables corruption. And that's what we're trying to, to uncover to a large extent. And, and these are the same messages we give to uh, U.S. companies that we engage with all the time and European companies um, who are very much concerned about doing business what people call the Uzbekistan way. Hmm. And, and that's just their way of saying Uzbekistan has endemic corruption, so the only way we can do business there is by also playing that game. But I think it's important to recognize, and this is what we say to these companies, but you may be doing more harm than good uh, by so. perpetuating this myth. Um, and so I, I would strongly encourage not to get lost on political opposition because it's an easy allegation to make, uh, particularly in the Uzbekistan context, uh, that that's how they def- the government has defended themselves in different international fora, mm. um, but I just don't think the facts actually bear out right. um, in terms of, of, of who is producing information. And also, it doesn't mean the facts aren't true. They can be telling true facts and still not be supportive of the government. And so, so I just wanted to clarify that, right. because right. I do think it's risky uh, to, 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 uh, <clears throat> to say that politics 
is what's driving efforts to end corruption. Mm -hmm. Thank right? you. And political motivation. Thank, thank you, Brian. And uh, I have Bruce here. And also there are two other countries that we did not yet touch upon. And those are perhaps a, a bigger case. As I'm talking about Turkmenistan and then uh, uh, Tajikistan, uh, uh, Bruce Panier. And again, in, in cases of the involvement of presidential family in some of those uh, corrupt businesses, also the case, and we have seen that in, in recently uh, released Panama Papers in Tajikistan's case and some other Central Asian presidential families' cases in Turkmenistan, as Natalia said, is a uh, black box. So what we have discussed so far in terms of the practices and the corruption, how they are compared with these two countries, Bruce Panier? We know there's corruption, of course, in both countries, and, and even in the case of, of Turkmenistan, where we don't have a lot of information, we still have some information. Yeah. Uh, to first address the fa the family policy, policy. Uh, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan do compare very well because we do have essentially a family-run government slash business going on in these countries. You know, the Rahman family, of course, uh, they and and President Rahman has nine children. So this is this is a large family. But you hear stories all the time about um, once he was appointed head of, at that time, Speaker of Parliament. But certainly once he had control over the country as, as Tajik president, uh, you know, huge amounts of people from Dangara region, many of his relatives, moved from there to Dushan Bay because they sensed that this was a chance for them to get in on business opportunities. And, and in fact, that seems to be exactly what's happened. If you can trace the major businesses in Tajikistan and who's the owner, uh, you will find somewhere along the line that it is either a direct relative of Rahman or, or somehow somebody who's related to him through marriage or something. Turkmenistan's undergoing the same process now with Verdi Mukhamedov. Under Niyazov, where, and, and again, I'll finish up with Niyazov because he actually did provide some insight into corruption in the country, but Niyazov was an orphan, so he didn't have any family. But Verdi Mukhamedov, of course, did bring his family in, and they seem to be doing quite well in business. There's uh, talk all over, certainly, uh, again, from opposition sites, and, and I don't want to discredit them. I thought that was a valid point to say that, that just being an opponent of government doesn't mean that your information is, is bogus. Uh, and so we have the these Turkmen opposition websites that say Berdy Mukhamedov's sister, his brother-in-law, uh, various other relatives are, are now his sister supposedly controls most of the economy in Ashgabat. His brother-in-law is is now the uh, one overseeing the, the tobacco industry in Turkmenistan, although that's been chipped away at a little bit. We covered that. But even in the case, of, you know, to get back to Niyazov and the corruption that was there, there is a logic in Turkmenistan or, I mean, actually all throughout Central Asia, and it's been there since day one, that, that everyone in the government's dirty and the they're only waiting when they want to get rid of you. You, everyone has corruption charges against, or they're corrupt in some way, and that's how they pull the plug on your your career right there. Niyazov used to make a point of when he dismissed people, bringing them up in public and enlisting the property that they had acquired while they were in their positions, multiple houses, multiple cars, multiple wives in the case of some of these people, too, that were being taken care of in various houses, too. So we know for sure that in Turkmenistan, uh, at least under Niyazov, and I have no reason to believe that's changed, but under Niyazov, government officials regularly use those positions to acquire vast amounts of wealth that no one in the regular citizens in the country couldn't even imagine touching. So there is a lot of corruption in Turkmenistan, and there is a lot of corruption in Tajikistan. Uh, you know, it's it's more of a pyramid shape, though. It all leads up to the top, and of course, no matter what they say about anti-corruption dri uh, campaigns, drives, the top figures are so rarely touched, and certainly the head of state and his family are off limits. Even Gulnara Karimova in Uzbekistan mm -hmm. is, is facing investigation outside Uzbekistan, and she's under house arrest. Well, She's confined to her home in, in Uzbekistan, but there are no charges against her in Uzbekistan. Right. Thank you, Bruce Manier. So let's la take a short break here. When we come back, uh, we will discuss impact of corruption on society, politics, and the investment environment at large. <laughs> Welcome back to the Majlis, a Central Asia podcast at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Today we are discussing corruption in Central Asia. What does it do and how does it affect to the society, country, politics, and it is business climate. Discussing the subject with me is David Lewis, author of the recent corruption report on Uzbekistan. Uh, Brian Kempel, U.S. attorney with inside knowledge of some corrupt businesses in Uzbekistan. Natalia Malarchuk, national chair of Kazakhstan chapter of Transparency International. Uh, and Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlak Owazi, a Central Asia blog at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. I am Mohammed Tahir, director of the Turkmen Service at Radio Free Europe. Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Majlis. 
Now, uh, let's talk a little bit, David, uh, about the impact of corruption. Uh, we discussed about the, how uh, it's being played in, in politics and everything. What does it do to the economy? Well, corruption is, a, you know, as Natalia pointed out, is a sort of multifaceted phenomenon. And so it's quite hard to say exactly what it does to the economy. Uh, there's obviously lots of countries that suffer from quite high levels of corruption, but also have high levels of economic growth. Uh, China is the obvious example of that. But Central Asian states have, for their level of income, have a particularly high level of poor governance in ways that I think do have a negative impact on the economy. Uh, even where you get high levels of economic growth, as has been the case in Kazakhstan, for example, in the past, uh, primarily because of oil and gas uh, exports, the poor governance in several of these countries means that when you get an economic decline, when you get an economic recession, the economy really struggles and society really struggles to cope with uh, what is going on in uh, the economy. It has a big impact on inequality, hmm. and that's what we're finding across most of the region is that it concentrates wealth in a few hands at the top of society and accentuates the difference between uh, the bottom and the top and also makes it very difficult to sort of build up a, a strong and resilient middle class in the economy. So although you may see high headline figures of economic growth, it's not what development specialists call inclus inclusive growth, growth that really includes the whole society. So therefore, you get these social tensions that build up around, uh, you know, accusations that money's been pilfered away by well-connected political figures. And uh, these social tensions have obviously a long-term impact on political stability. Uh, the other impact I think you can see, certainly in Uzbekistan, is the extent to which corruption has made it hard to set up a business, to make uh, a profit on entrepreneurship. And therefore, you've seen a big outflow in terms of labor migration, people moving to Russia, where they feel they can uh, make an income. So there's a whole range of issues that are not simply about saying, you know, it slows down economic growth. It's much more about the way in which money is divided, the way in which resources are divided in society. And that has a direct political impact on, on potential stability down the road. Mm -hmm. Bruce, uh, in Central Asia, we see two things common. One is the dictatorship, like authoritarian system, Uh, since uh, their independence uh, from Soviet Union and corruption together. So what is the connection between the political system and corruption in those regions? And is there any role they, that the, this corruption plays in shaping the political direction of one or the other country? Well, I, I suppose to some extent it's patronage. Uh, you know, you got to remember, too, that, that um, all these leaders, Tajikistan, of course, fell into civil war pretty quickly. But, but the other leaders had been selected during Soviet times, and they didn't really have anything of a support base. So I suppose that, that uh, allowing people that they thought they could trust and kind of depend on to enter the government and sweeten the, their loyalty, uh, so to speak, by offering them pieces of the economic pie of the country, it tended to create um, something of a support base around them, and that was the simplest and, and probably fastest way to build up something that looked like a, a firm and solid government in the country. Um, mm. You know, again, they, there was no reason for the people to like these leaders. And, and if they had held legitimate elections in the 1990s, probably none of them would be there now. But what they did was just surround themselves with, with some capable people. And uh, with the, in addition to the positions they were offered, I suppose you could say a fringe benefit was that they were either offered or allowed to take control over various sectors of the economy and enrich themselves which gave the, you know, they gained a, or a certain amount of loyalty to the leader because ultimately he was protecting them uh, while they uh, went around and, and got richer and lived better lives. So uh, this is, you know, from day one, this was the system you had, and it was because these, uh, you know, again, these were unpopular leaders who probably wouldn't have been reelected, and they needed strong people around them to keep them in power, and this was the incentive they offered. Hmm. Uh, Brian, uh, looking into this from the international perspective, Uh, how does the Western companies survive in this environment? We know the corruption is everywhere in politics and economy and uh, wherever you go in the regions. Well, I'll, I'll be the first to say that the corruption occurs in the United States and that companies in the United States engage in corruption too. And I just wanted to say that because companies generally don't survive in a corrupt environment. And in the United States, often it's because they get investigated, prosecuted, and taken to court. Um, in Uzbekistan, um, what we've seen over, the, over time is that the corruption leads to deterioration of the quality of the 
services or the product. It leads to high risk for the, uh, especially the foreign um, employees who have to travel to those countries because they are subject to laws back in, in the United States. Uh, but finally, I think the overall way that Western companies deal with it, and this bears out in, in, in all of the data, um, they just don't invest. Mm. And so they don't go to Uzbekistan. They don't go anywhere uh, where they, the reputable companies, the big companies, right? they're not going to go into these environments. And so by setting up uh, this environment, uh, this business environment through these corrupt you end up pretty much with the lowest of the low companies that we could possibly send over there. Uh, companies that were uniquely formed for these and, and others. Now, where that really there was a difference here, and that was with Talia Sonero. And, you know, that's a big company. But recognize that it did not survive, right? And, and there's uh, Spentex, an Indian company. Uh, it, it had all of its property taken by the Uzbek government. Right. You know, they don't survive because the businesses aren't seen as a long-term investment in this type of environment. They're seen as, as a way to extract money in the short term. Now, certain companies still try to stick it out. You know, for example, General Motors, uh, a U.S. company, has a plant in Tashkent, and it has a subsidiary in uh, Andijan. And recently there were reports that that subsidiary was engaging in in corruption vis-a-vis its shipments to Russia. And, you know, whether or not the U.S. company is aware of that, I don't know. Hmm. What I can say is, is that I don't, the U.S. company is not going to go in and pay the money to get the access, like a company like GM. That access is, is, is created by the political uh, needs of the time. For example, General Motors went in because Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, made it her top priority to get General Motors into Uzbekistan. It is not a safe investment for General Motors, and I think they understand that. But I do think that what they are looking at is a long-term market access to Central Asia and Russia, and they're hoping they can survive through that time. They're hoping that they, that they are not themselves uh, subject to corrupt requests. You know, I, I don't have any, any evidence that they have been. But when they are, that's a difficult decision for them to make. And what their U.S. attorneys will tell them is your sanctions are worse than any possible benefit you could get. So the best thing for you to do is to cooperate with the authorities, produce the information that led to the allegations, and then divest from the area after you pay your fines. And that's what Julia Sonero has done. Mm. That's what a U.S. lawyer for, for a corporation would advise <clears throat> uh, their lawyers. And, and so I, I do think that, that there really is no way for a company to survive in the long run in this environment. And unfortunately, what you end up with then is a lot of uh, poor companies. I don't mean poor financially. I mean poorly managed companies or companies that uh, are willing to skirt the laws. And, you know, we have those in every country. Um, they just happen to get uh, attracted to these types of markets mm. a little bit uh, mm. more mm. because they feel they can get away with it. Right. And Natalia, the, the privatization is obviously a big uh, highlight uh, these days in Kazakhstan, uh, so does in the, some other Central Asian countries. How does the corruption affect to this process? In terms of business it's, uh, and economy, it's uh, at a whole as whole. It's uh, it's it's very difficult. It's really connected directly to political will of any official, beginning from very very local official to higher level official. Its uh, business environment is directly connected to different procedure of uh, licensing, etc. And uh, I'd like to say also that. When foreign investors come to the country, they are actually shocked when they see the practice uh, of, of doing business that we have here. We actually don't, still don't have a culture of doing business here in Kazakhstan. That's why when business company comes to Kazakhstan, it's, uh, it has two choices, to continue business or, and accept rules that exist here and uh, work directly with officials, governmental officials, or just leave the country as, for example, as people from Telesanera explained me, actually, when they left Kazakhstan. So they, the explanation was as uh, we can't <laughs> work in this uh, way anymore. 
I understand that it's not very frank uh, uh, answer was, but it it describes very uh, very many things. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, I know that uh, from our uh, being based on our research and our analysis, uh, I can say that small and medium business uh, now, especially now, last two years, they are dying. Actually, foreign business they trying to do something in Kazakhstan, but uh, they survive only because they have budget, they have money, and they have support from their government. And when we talk about foreign investments, we also have to mention that in these relationships, uh, in this sphere of doing business, let's say so, they have great support from their governments. Uh, Embassies work too hard to communicate with our government to support their business here in Kazakhstan. The situation is weird. And the uh, more complex thing is that nobody wants to research all that. And uh, it's, uh, we have mm. too little data on everything, we, on how investors feel themselves, on uh, how our business feels with themselves. So it's, I, I can't answer so very specifically on your, to your question. You said no, no one uh, researched data uh, on uh, those countries before coming for an investment. Uh, Bruce, if you wish, or it's open for anyone who wants to uh, comment on this subject, uh, put yourself in a, in a position of a businessman sitting somewhere in Europe, outside China, perhaps, or the United States. How do you see Central Asia as a potential location of investment? What do you see there? Well, I mean, it, it, I would draw a, d- a clear distinction between being a Western businessman and being a Chinese businessman here. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of opportunities. They have a lot of resources in Central Asia you'd like to get a hold of. Uh, laws in the West generally preclude doing business in Central Asia because everyone knows that corruption. You're going to have to pay somebody off somewhere down the line. You're going to have to come into some kind of agreement that will not only be with your business partner, but as, as David pointed out in his, his recent paper, it, uh, your business partner is also connected to people in various government offices, too. So so you're going to have to deal with that and if you get caught by your own country um you're going to get you might go to jail your business might get shut down there's a lot of things that could happen the chinese and the russians and there's a few other countries that uh, I could probably name two here. When they go into the, the into these kind of things, they have an understanding of what they're getting into. And the corruption angle doesn't really – I'm sure it bothers them, but they play into it with with a lot more ease uh, than than uh, the what their Western counterparts could possibly hope to engage in. They won't – even their own government is not likely to invest them in, or investigate them. And that's why you see, uh, you know, for instance, the only onshore contract in Turkmenistan for gas is, is the Chinese National Petroleum Corporation – How much money did they have to pay to get that? I have no idea. But but did they just get a contract through honest dealings? Unlikely. Uh, and and there's a lot of other Chinese companies that are doing business in Central Asia, getting contracts that, that you couldn't – no one in the West seems to have been able to get or was willing to get. And I'll just finish by using the example of Uzbekistan. Now, Uzbekistan has oil and gas too, and a lot of people would like to invest in that. Again, what we see, if you look at the companies that are investing in that, they're almost all Asian or Russian. Uh, the one sole, – the sole exception doing business – in Uzbekistan for a brief while was Zeromax. It was a company that was registered in Switzerland and connected to Zulgonar Karimova. And for years, that company made a lot of money procuring the um, the pipes, uh, the equipment and machinery and stuff that was supposed to be used for these oil and gas deposits. Uh, and they were, they were the only one. No other Western company could or wanted to get involved with the Uzbek oil and gas industry. And as a consequence, uh, you know, it's it's all Chinese companies, Malaysian, mm. uh, Russian, South Korean, some Japanese, that's it. Right. I think, unfortunately, we need to wrap up our discussion here. But the final question, uh, these days, when economy is going down in the region, everyone is in need of financial help. Where does this climate of corruption put Central Asia, uh, uh, David? Well, I think it puts it in quite a difficult situation because not only does this affect foreign investment, of course, it also affects multilateral and bilateral foreign assistance. So uh, organizations like the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development all have faced the same problem of uh, trying to distribute funds in ways that don't get them enmeshed in uh, corrupt practice. Uh, And there have been several cases of really very difficult uh, situations involving those kind of Uh, funders. And the same with many bilateral government agencies. So struggling to find ways, and this is not unique to Central Asia, of course, but 
is particularly problematic in the region, struggling to find ways to fund good projects in the region without, again, getting caught up in government or business corruption. And that means for Central Asia, yeah, it's uh, it's in a, in a difficult position when when there's an economic uh, decline, you then uh, have both a, a drop in foreign investment, a drop in domestic investment, capital flowing out of the region, and also uh, a lack of willingness by international banks to really invest in the region. So in other words, this is a perfect storm of, uh, of external sort of turning away from the region. I think that's very bad for the situation. The only plus side has been mentioned is the potential for investment from China and elsewhere, but that comes along with the problem of poor governance that might accompany those investments. Right. Uh, Brian, uh, final note on this uh, subject. Yeah, you know, I would really like to note that there is, and, and I'm glad that, that we've talked about Kazakhstan, uh, you know, the outcome of this case, uh, these, this attempt for the U.S. government to seize uh, the money, the bribery money that was paid by the telecommunications to gain access to the Uzbek market, you know, right now that is a lot of money. It's about $850 million. And one of the struggles is, is we all, everyone, including the U.S. government, wants to see it responsibly repatriated back to those countries for the benefit of the people. And there was a great example of that in the Bota Foundation with Kazakhstan. It was a settlement agreement. It was a, mm-hmm. it was a, it was a corruption case. There was a settlement agreement entered into between the U.S. government, the Swiss government, and the Kazakh government. And there were a lot of strings attached to returning that money. But it was a success. And the Kazakh government really showed leadership by accepting those conditions. Now, you know, I think that that is our uh, big concern with regards to this money uh, for Gulnar Karimov's account, because we would love to see it go back and benefit the people of Uzbekistan, and that is our goal. But because of this endemic corruption, it is very difficult to responsibly repatriate the money. It, it, uh, morally and ethically, you can't send money back into a corrupt regime knowing that it's going to be corrupted again when you've just seized it. Mm-hmm. And this is a real conundrum for all of us working on, on these issues of how do you fix these problems and how do you turn ill-gotten gains into success and investment back in these countries. And, you know, I don't have an answer for it, but we definitely are going to continue to work and engage with all of our counterparts mm-hmm. in civil society and the government, the U.S. and others, to find an answer to this. Um, but it is the governments of those countries that are preventing these answers from coming forth, right. uh, the current leaders. And we really do hope that there are people within these governments who want reform because the U.S. government and others are looking for those people to work with to help repatriate assets. Right, right. Um, because the people of Uzbekistan need them. Right. Natalia, final comment on uh, how does the corrupt record of two Central Asian countries are harming their ability to get the financial help that they need at these days. What role this corrupt record is playing in their ability to get the money or not able to get that money? It's a big role. Uh, everything is played, uh, it plays a big role and all that. And I hope that the answer to the question of what is the more important uh, for our government officials, for our citizens, will be what is the more important money or the country? Uh, the answer will be the country itself, and we will so because right now taking into account um, the financial crisis that we faced, and I think it will be worse in uh, next year too. We actually will lose the state itself. That's why uh, our government and our citizens, maybe the citizens of Kazakhstan, including the government officials, uh, need to answer the question, do they want to save the state itself? If not, the corruption will be flourish. If yes, uh, we will, uh, all those steps that were declared uh, will be implemented and uh, we will f- move forward. Uh, but the decision on up to government officials and our citizens. Right now, I don't see any will from the government and from the citizens that everybody wants to counteract corruption. Right. Unfortunately, the country is in a depression. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Natalia Malar. Thank you, Natalia Malarchuk, National Chair of Kazakhstan, Chapter of Transparency International, for your insightful thoughts also. 
Big thanks to David uh, Lewis, author of the recent report on corruption in Uzbekistan by the Open Society Institute, and Brian uh, Campbell. He was attorney with inside knowledge of some corrupt businesses in, in Central Asia, especially in Uzbekistan. Also, Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlak Awazi, a Central Asia blog at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being part of the Majlis today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is from me, Mohamed Tahir, Director of the Turkmen Service at Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. Bye-bye.